Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message this morning is Part 1 of Be at Peace. Jesus, in the book of Mark, was guiding his disciples and preparing them for a ministry on their own after he would leave them. He had many things to share with them and tell them about what was coming in the, in the days and weeks, months and years ahead for the rest of their lives, in fact. Today I'm going to speak from Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 41. Here's what the scripture says. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had, been, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Have you ever had to break up an argument? Maybe you're just a passive one and you observe arguments or maybe you create situations where it lets you and him fight but probably there's been a time when you've had to break up an argument maybe even a physical fight I grew up in a family of five children and we used to fight when we were little and then I came to the realization that there was an odd number of people in the family five and parents were seven I'd been to enough Baptist business meetings that I knew how to conduct a business meeting so from then on, instead of fighting, we would have a business meeting and we would vote. And, we, and I didn't allow anybody to abstain. I was moderator of the family business meetings. And if everybody voted, it would come out one way or the other. Now, if you've raised kids, you've probably broken up an argument or two. If you haven't, I want to know about it. I want to know what the secret was. You, do you ever... Do you remember that uh, when you had to break up those arguments among children or sometimes adults that no one's ever at fault? No one ever assumes the blame. It's always, it's always someone else's fault. Well, what about in the household of faith? What about in the church? Surely Christians could never get caught up in disagreements or arguments. Surely not. Well, we know each other better than that, don't we? Uh, I have to say, church, I have certainly enjoyed the three years of peace in this congregation. Praise God. It's been an unprecedented experience in my life. Let's keep it up. Let's be unified. Let's love each other. I believe that our unities kept us together. Our unities kept the church open. I heard of a, chur a church, true story, friends of mine were in this service where a pastor was fired because he did not go to the post office often enough. That was the argument. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> or how about a church that splits because one group doesn't like the new praise and worship music and they, they for some reason think that the only music that God likes are hymns created within a narrow span of time in human history. 
Or how about a family, this is a true story, who refuses to attend the only church in town because the pastor's wife teaches a class of women and men. Or how about this? How about a church that splinters off because they don't like what version, what English translation of the Bible the pastor uses? Well, even Jesus had challenges within his own group. Can you imagine that? The disciples being taught by the Messiah himself. Jesus had challenges with them. And in this chapter, Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 50, there's a section of scripture here that which comes between Jesus' second and third prediction of his death. And these verses deal with how his disciples will live after he's gone, how they will minister and how they will mature as believers. And it's wrapped up in just a few verses right here. And these verses that I just read to you and the rest will be next week, the overall theme is found in verse 50. Be at peace with one another. That's a good verse for you to underline, circle, memorize. That's not a hard one to memorize, is it? Be at peace with one another. The disciples asked this question. Who's the greatest? Jesus and his disciples had returned to Caper Ca Capernaum. It was a fishing village on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus' home base, and evidently the disciples had been arguing amongst themselves as they journeyed along. Jesus wanted to know what they'd been discussing, but they were apparently embarrassed to tell him. They knew better than to tell him what they'd been discussing. And Jesus had been teaching them about the kingdom of God, and they were expecting to, to have a high position in that kingdom based on their devotion and their service to him now. And their idea of a kingdom was the human idea of kingdoms in that day. They knew that kings had thrones. They knew that kings had subjects. And kings had people in places of honor. His number one person, his number two person, his, his number three people, if it was more than one person. They had this, this, this lateral idea of importance just as an earthly kingdom. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But these disciples wanted to know who would have the highest place. Who would be esteemed higher and better than the other disciples? Can't you just hear their arguments? But I've worked harder. I've slept less. I've gotten up early and gone to bed late. What have you done? Whose throne would be the best? Who would have the honor of sitting next to Jesus himself? And who would be the farthest away? In verse 30, 35, Jesus sits down because that was the posture of teachers in that day. He sat down which means he had a lesson he was going to tell them. And he began to teach them. He taught them about the true path to greatness, which is very different from what the, the world thinks. And that path is found in being the servant of all. Jesus repeated this teaching different times in his ministry. Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. The greatest among you will be your servant. Matthew chapter 10, verses 43 through 44. Whoever would be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever would be the first must be slave of all. Luke chapter 22. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Luke chapter 22, verse 26. The scripture says, instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. So God's economy and God's political system, if it were, his, his method by which he chooses his leaders seems to be backwards by the world's comparison. The world says... Put yourself forward. But the kingdom of God 
in the kingdom of God says, put yourself last. The world says, claw your way to the top. Jesus says, in the kingdom of God, lower yourself. Jesus, or the king, excuse me, in the world, we are told to get ahead. We, we push others down. But in the kingdom, we pull others up. The world tells us to be self-focused so that we can be the best. Jesus tells us in the kingdom to be others-focused. The world tells us one thing and Jesus tells us give and you'll receive. Jesus says pray for your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Give a blessing instead of an insult. And being great in the world's eyes means being served by others, but in the kingdom it means serving others. God himself will raise up those he wants honored. When I was an associate pastor, our church, at one of the churches I served, our church had a banquet at that banquet, there was a head table for the church staff. Susan and I were so uncomfortable at the head table. It was referenced as the head table. Never again do I want to sit at a, at a head table of a church staff unless it's a roast to Bill Highsmith. Other than that, <laughs> other than that, I just want to sit with the people. I've never been comfortable with that. And one of, the, one of the first things I did when I came here, and I'm not making any judgments about the past, one of the first things I did when I came here was remove the 24-7 pastor's parking sign. Pastor's parking, 24-7. You know, if I ever come here at 3 a.m., I am quite certain there will be plenty of parking places for me. And besides, I felt like the, the place, the, the, the corner spot there could be used by someone who had special needs. There's plenty of parking, and unless the Lord deems otherwise, I'll be able to park and walk in the building just like everybody else. You know, my wife and I really appreciate your kindness to us. We, we appreciate the place of honor that you make for us, but, but we don't consider ourselves any better than anyone else. You'll, you'll not see our faces on billboards around Nashville promoting ourselves or our ministry. Jesus said, if you want to be great, Learn to be the servant of all. Let me take that a step further. Jesus didn't say this exactly, but I think we can gain from his words that Jesus implied, even if you don't want to be great, be the servant of all because that's what Christ did for us. It's what he does for us now. Jesus serves us. He's our Savior. He serves us. We serve him, but he serves us. And in verse 36 and 37. Look there if you would. Jesus gave an illustration. He took a little child whom he'd placed among them and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Now in this day, children were not held in the, in the same high regard in biblical times as they as they are today. They were, children were thought of more as uh, second or third class citizens. They, they weren't really invited ever to adult conversations or adult gatherings. Children were seen, and this is a hard word, but it, it really is true. Children were seen more as slaves until they grew up. You know, they had no, no power. They had no social status uh, whatsoever. They were not put on a pedestal. They were lowly and last. And, and this thought really carried over until 
workers' laws just a few hundred years ago came up in the developed world. And this is just a thought, but maybe we've gone too far in the other direction. <laughs> maybe, maybe something, well, not maybe, there is something wrong when children are just allowed to interrupt adult conversations and they're, they're, when they're allowed to, to dictate what a family does or doesn't do. And I don't want to go in on all that. But in this time, on this day, Jesus used this illustration of children to illustrate the simple act of love, attention, and affection. Jesus embraced this child. Jesus said, by example, that greatness comes from accepting the lowest social status in order to serve others. And in this case, a child. You lower yourself below that one so you can love and minister to their needs. And instead of requiring that the lowly ones focus on you and lift you up, you focus on them and lift them up by serving them. This past week, I was talking with an Air Force officer who, who had just spent two and a half months on a special project. He was the officer in charge of a particular group of young officers. And I asked him, well, how did it go? And he, he quoted someone, and I, I, don't, I don't remember who it was, but he said, I was promoted to my highest level of incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I never want to do it again. You know, it's interesting how when we get in places of leadership, sometimes things can go to our head and we think we're all that until we walk into a situation and we realize that we too have been promoted to our highest level of incompetence. I think about who are the lonely ones in our society today? Are there forgotten people? Are there forgotten people in nursing homes? Are there homeless people that are treated as the lowly ones? Are there addicts that can't seem to break their habits that are treated as the lowly ones? Are we willing to get dirty to serve the lowly? If we, if we see a lowly person, is our first thought that we better not shake hands or, or we need to avoid contact lest we catch something? And the, the deeper truth here is, however, when we, when, we, when we serve the down and out, when we reach down to be the servant of all, those who cannot help us in return, think about that. Have you done something for someone who cannot in any way do something for you in return? It's easy to do something for someone who can do something for us. And then we expect it. But how about if we reach out in kindness and we serve people who have no ability to return it in any way? When we do that, we are serving Jesus himself. Next, John referenced those unlike us. John referenced those unlike us. Let me repeat there in verse 38. Go with me there again. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We told him to stop because he was not one of us. Don't stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us, truly. I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. We could spend a lot of time here, but the bottom line is that we may have major differences with another person, another denomination, another persuasion, but if they are preaching Jesus and lifting him up, they are our brothers and sisters. <clears throat> this does not mean aligning with false gods. This does, not mean that say, this does not mean we're all praying to the same God because we are not. Allah and Jehovah, God, are not the same God. And there are 
There are, there are not many ways to Jehovah God. Jesus is the only way, period. Now, what I'm talking about here, though, I believe what Jesus said was this. People may have different opinions on the second coming or church government or methods of baptism. And I could go on with that list. But if people love Jesus and are following him and giving a cup of cold water in his name, we should extend love and acceptance. You know, there are things we can unify on with other churches to make a difference in this world. And I believe we are coming up on a day where many of us in our Christian journeys are going to have to set aside our differences and come together for the cause of Christ. Well, what about us? What about the household of faith? This household of faith, Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, do we participate in, in subtle ways of seeking to put ourselves above others? I hope none of us do. Chuck Swindoll, the Bible preacher, tells uh, very good stories. I hear him on the radio from time to time. But he told a, once a piercing example about how he realized he was trying to put himself forward. He and his son were at a father-son retreat and the afternoon activity for fathers and sons was canoeing. And as they were prepared to meet the other fathers and sons at the dock to get their canoes, he noticed one canoe that was in better shape than the other, who's looking for the best canoe. And he was making a beeline right for that canoe. And then it hit him. The Holy Spirit blew the whistle on him. The first shall be last. And so he stepped back and allowed another team, another father-son team, have the best canoe. Are there, are there church members or people you know who want a certain role in order to manipulate, in order to put pressures on others, to, or in order to grind out an agenda? Are there people who politic for particular areas of so-called status within the church? I hope not. Are there people who come to visit us on Sunday and leave having not been spoken to by anyone? I hope not. When we have our handshaking time, I hope that you will go around and make everyone feel welcome. Someone told me once, if I join your church, will everyone quit shaking my hand on Sunday morning? <laughs> hey, that's what I love to hear. Let's be inclusive. Let's make people feel welcome. The scripture tells us that the last shall be first. Are you willing to put yourself in a, in a humble role, in a servant role to serve others? So in turn, you are serving Jesus. And let's examine our motives in light of being a servant. The, the older I get, the more I have to question whether or not I'm, I've got a selfish motive in what I'm doing. And the, the harder I try to abolish those thoughts and just really, I just really want to be a servant of the Lord to people. And I know this, that uh, being a servant can get messy. A lot of us don't like messes. Being a servant can interrupt our schedule. It can interrupt our things to do list, right, Bill? Bill's got legal pad after legal pad, and at the top of every legal pad, it says things to do. And I guess he has to remind himself of that every day, things to do. How many times do you make it through that list without being interrupted? Not often. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we have got to be flexible. We've got to be servants of all. And when we are servants of all, our schedules might be they, Our schedules will be interrupted for the cause of Christ. Am I taking up my cross and den denying myself for the advancement of the kingdom? Do I put myself 
last in my family and in my church family and consider it an honor to serve all. Jesus' words, the greatest among you will be your servant. The opposite of what the world teaches. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time where we've shared your word together. I pray that it has mined itself deeply in our hearts so that when we leave here today, we're different people. We're refreshed and we're renewed and we have a vision of being a true servant. We have a vision of choosing to be the last person in line, a vision of choosing to be the one who gives up something so that someone else might have, a vision for us to understand that when we give a glass of cold water as simple as that to someone who needs it, you receive that as if it's coming to you. Lord, we thank you for Jesus setting the example for us, being the last, being the servant of all. Heavenly Father, I pray for someone today who has not been saved, somebody who is not a follower of Jesus Christ, that today may be the day that they repent of sin and that they follow Jesus, trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together for our invitation hymn. We'll be waiting for you down front. Tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me.